Thank you very much, and uh, good morning. I'm delighted to join this distinguished cast of speakers, and my apologies to Her Excellency that I have to keep to the original timetable on your program. I want to emphasize this morning that the government and City UK have a common aim to maintain and enhance the UK's position as a leading global financial center. And that is central to all our policies, not simply those concerning regulation. Restoring our public finances provides the stability we all need for sustainable faster growth in financial services. Rebalancing our economy away from the public sector, away from the boom in housing, towards regions, manufacturing, new technologies, that opens up new opportunities for financial institutions to support new, smaller companies through equity finance. The key, in our view, to regulation is the right regulation, not uh, shoddy regulation that throttles real competition, not poor supervision that allows excessive leverage, but the right regulation that helps you and the government to adjust to rapidly changing global markets, that underpins the stability we need in the financial system, that helps restore public confidence in it, and that will drive sustainable growth on which the new jobs depend. Let me turn specifically to Europe, my allotted subject, because I, there is no other area immediately adjacent to us that has seen in the past such poor regulation at the macro level and such incompetent supervision. Consider over the last 10 years how the principal <coughs> Eurozone member states have broken the Maastricht rules, the criteria for debt and management of the public finances, have abandoned the Lisbon agenda to which they committed to, all, to more flexible labor markets, structural reforms of pensions and welfare, completion of the single market in energy and services, have, ignoring all warnings, progressed a single currency for wildly different economies without compensating fiscal transfer arrangements, and finally adulterated their own stress tests for their very own banks to exclude sovereign exposures and to allow off-balance sheet securitization for public finance. The UK approach to regulation is based on a number of principles. We support regulation where it helps complete or enhance the single market rather than fragment it. Secondly, we want regulation at the European level that is consistent and non-discriminatory, that applies across all the member states and certainly does not discriminate between those inside the zone and those outside it. Thirdly, that that regulation is proportionate, that there genuinely is a case for it at the European level rather than the national level. Fourthly, that it supports growth rather than stifles it. And fifthly, that it is evidence-based. And I have yet to see some of the evidence that should lie behind some of the more recent proposals. Let me test those principles against a few of the current proposals. So far as state aid rules are concerned, we complied with a very tough application by the Commission of those rules in our restructuring of the Royal Bank of Scotland and Lloyds. It is vital that the Commission apply equally tough behavioural and structural measures when other member states finally have to recapitalise their own banks. Second, the European supervisory authorities. We welcome those if they deliver high quality, consistent supervision, if they pick up systemic risks earlier, and if they ensure more honest enforcement of the existing rules. Third, on capital, we do not think that it is wise to allow the Capital Requirements Directive, in effect, to water down 
the Basel Agreement. We think it should set a floor and that higher levels of capital should reflect decisions in individual member states and where they decide to, as we have done, to tackle implicit guarantees. We have recapitalized. We have insisted that our banks hold more liquid assets. It is for other member states, too, to recognize the extent of their own taxpayer guarantee, to quantify it, and to restrict it in the way that we are now proposing. <clears throat> Fourthly, the Alternative Investment Directive, as originally proposed, of course, failed our test of discrimination and proportionality. Now better, but uh, like uh, the proposals on some of the more recent uh, activities, I think something of a sideshow <laughs> to the main events. Emir, it is vital in taking these proposals forward that we do not encourage fragmentation by currency or impose additional costs on very successful industries. On the contrary, we need an approach in this area that is non-discriminatory and encourages those successful businesses in the European Union to continue to compete globally. The financial transactions tax, it is not clear to me how this would meet the test of encouraging growth when the Commission's own estimate of extra cost is some 200 billion, around 1.8% of European GDPs. If applied globally, if linked to flows, flows of aid, then of course there may be a case. But if this is to be an EU or even a Eurozone limited tax to help the bailouts, absolutely not. And finally, MIFID II, we need to be very clear how we square the compliance costs that are being estimated with the aim of reducing volatility and the additional benefit we would get from uh, uh, putting supervision onto a European rather than national basis. In short, I suggest to you this morning that the European regulatory agenda is now a major challenge for the United Kingdom. And I want to assure you that our government, the coalition government, is determined to protect the interests of the financial sector and to advance the comparative advantages that the United Kingdom already enjoys. Equally, and finally, I suggest to you that this is a challenge for the European Union too, to resist the slide into protectionist, discriminatory, oppressive regulation that would let our continent slip further behind. Let us always remember that while Europe is stalled, while the United States economy is stuttering, there is half of the world economy that continues to grow and to grow rapidly. And Europe needs to take advantage of that. It's now obvious that admitting Greece to the euro was a mistake. They said uh, they could not exclude the country of Plato. It would, in my view, be a much greater mistake for Europe's political leaders to misunderstand or ignore the lesson of Plato and not to recall the allegory of Plato's cave, where those chained within it failed to grasp that the shadows on the wall did not match the reality outside and continued to blind themselves to the illusion. This government is determined, with your support, to help Europe avoid that fate. Thank you. Can you take a short sure. time, yeah? Michael, th thank you very much indeed. Um, some questions. Let's take this opportunity of, of, of being... Oliver Lodge. Um, I wonder whether you could clarify for me, because it wasn't immediately clear to me, how within your principles, or where within your principles, lies the question of global competitiveness. To what extent are you expecting European regulators to factor into their decisions about directives and European regulations 
the impact on global competitiveness on the European financial services sector. And I wonder whether also perhaps you could extend your answer to clarify where you think UK regulators should stand on that, given the proposal to remove reference to international competitiveness from the primary legislation. Yes, well, on the first point, as I implied, we must not forget that half the world's economy is booming, is growing extremely fast, emerging markets finally emerging. And therefore, it should have, perhaps I should have added to the list of principles. It should be uh, implicit in everything we're doing in regulation at the European and the national level that we do not weaken our position in terms of international competitiveness. So, par, so far as uh, competitiveness of the uh, uh, banking and financial sectors in the, in the new uh, legislation that's being proposed, I think you're referring to, the Treasury Committee on which I sat recommended very firmly indeed that there should be a principal objective. We've had some success. You've seen the latest government response that puts competition in there. That doesn't satisfy us on the uh, committee. We continue to press this point in the separate draft committee that's looking at the, uh, the draft financial services bill, and we'll certainly keep uh, returning to it. The uh, financial secretary is before the committee tomorrow morning. I think this will be one of the, uh, one of the topics raised with really. <coughs> Financial Services Consumer Panel. Um, I'd like you to, to ask if you'd like to comment on to what extent you think there's a role for regulation either at European level or at domestic level in ensuring access to financial services, particularly for retail customers. Well, there are all sorts of um, roles we could add. We've got to be careful about um, cutting through caveat emptor and uh, legislating for access that the market would otherwise provide through the competition that I've just been asked about. So I think we need to be extremely careful at trying to legislate for access. Clearly, there are things that can be done nationally. I spoke to the uh, uh, membership of the Payments Council about our concerns, for example, that uh, users of basic banking services are no longer being allowed to access one particular bank's uh, ATMs. Um, there are other things there, but I think the answer, the way to address these, is through competition. And again, through opening up the banking system to ensuring that we really do have challenger banks, that newer banks have all the advantages that uh, the larger ones do of the payment system and other uh, common arrangements, and that therefore we give consumers a better deal that way, and we encourage more choice. Perhaps one last question. One right at the, the top there. Uh, uh, Ian Dilks, PwC. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks. I note your statement on the position of the British government. I just wonder if you could comment on to what extent the views are shared by any other of the member states and the ability of the UK to uh, influence the debate that you outlined. The government is now looking not simply at the regulatory agenda in financial services, but obviously at this whole issue of powers and competences and looking to see what case can be made for repatriation. And that obviously involves, first of all, seeing what appetite there is for some repatriation among some of the other member states alongside the United Kingdom. It secondly means building a coalition amongst those who are outside the zone that is in agreement with our principle that the, uh, the in should not be allowed to develop a legislative machinery all of their own. Now that is difficult work, not least because some of the ten outs want to be ins at some later stage and uh, we have to be equally careful about constructing a caucus of the ten when we're resisting the caucus of the, of the seventeen. So that is not easy work. And thirdly, of course, we have to build agreement for this within the coalition government itself. So this is, uh, is going to be hard pounding. But uh, there is no doubt that uh, uh, there is an appetite across some of the member states for re-examining some legislation. This may come more easily in some areas than others. Uh, when you've got uh, over five 
1.3 million people under the age of 25 were out of work. It seems quite hard to justify some of the more generous job protection legislation that came at us through the European route. There are over 40% of all under 25s out of work now in both Spain and Greece. Um, and we need to bear that. They have rights as well. So this may be easier in the areas of job protection than it is of uh, financial services. But it is work in hand. And I can assure you that uh, we need, of course, to maximize support across the Union amongst other member states who may be just as skeptical about the necessity for continuing to add to the ACCI unless it complies with some of the principles that I outlined. Michael, thank you very much. Precision, brevity, clarity, and a tour of Europe. Thank you.